Hi, I'm Mike Roberts, Head of the Electronic Music Department here at the Guildhall School. The other day we all decamped to LSO St Luke's, the impressive home of the London Symphony Orchestra, to deliver two masterclasses in film scoring and filmmaking. We're particularly excited at this time to deliver these masterclasses because they highlight the fact that we now offer film music as a principal study degree discipline. So that's electronic music, game audio, live electronics, sonic arts, music production and film music that can now be studied in the artistically rich environment of a music conservatoire here in the heart of London. Presenting our masterclass in film scoring is one of our long-standing professors, John Buchanan. Last year, Jono explained his production workflow in a masterclass that's gone on to receive over 320,000 views online. And I know that his expertise is worth sharing more widely than that. So, if you enjoy this masterclass, please do like, share and hit subscribe. For now, I know you're going to enjoy it as Jono delivers a true masterclass in film scoring. Would you join me in welcoming to the stage Professor and Composer Jono Buchanan. Thank you so much, Paul. Much appreciated. Thanks a lot. OK, welcome. So nice to see so many people here. Thank you so much for giving up a Wednesday lunchtime to come and learn a little more about film scoring in Logic Pro 10. Um, I appreciate you probably all rather be eating sandwiches, so thank you for being here. As Paul mentioned, this is effectively the second episode in our Logic Pro 10 Masterclass series. A year ago, I was standing on a stage at Milton Court just down the road, taking you through Logic's workflow. And obviously today, the subject we'll be going through is film scoring instead. But the reason why I'm mentioning that Masterclass apart from, you know, a little bit of narcissism, perhaps, um, is because that video is, as Paul mentioned, online, and it may well prove to be a really useful additional learning resource. Last year, I started by saying that we were going to be going through tips for beginner, intermediate, and more advanced Logic users, and that's true again today, but it is fair to be saying we've got a lot to cover, and we're going to be going on at a fair old clip, so definitely go back to that video if you haven't had a chance to look at it already. OK, on with the show. So we have a film to work on today which has been made specially for us this afternoon. It's called Just In Time. And the first thing we're going to do long before we even think about opening up Logic is just to view it in quick time. I'm just going to back the volume down a little bit because it's quite noisy. And I'm just going to press play and we should be all ready to go. So this is Just In Time. Hello, mate. Guess what? She said yes. You never make it on time. Yeah, not by myself, I won't. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Hi. I made it. Yeah, just in time. Okay, so just your classic boy gets text from girl, boy does parkour, boy meets girl story. <laughs> okay, so we've all been there. Um, maybe not all of us. Okay, so. There we are. We've watched that in quick time. Now, the reason for that is because, of course, the temptation whenever you're about to start working on a new film scoring uh, project is just to get the video into Logic and immediately just start throwing sounds around and just beginning to see what sticks. But we're going to be a little bit more strategic than that. And the reason that we've watched the film sort of outside of Logic is because 
What we really need to do, I think, whenever we're starting a new film scoring project is to identify a theme, something which can get us up and running and maybe instruct us in terms of the sounds that we might then go on to use in terms of building the project that we're working to. And I think it's fair to say that the sort of principal theme of this film is time. From the moment the guy looks at his watch all the way through this kind of race the whole way through until the moment that the girl says, okay, yeah, you made it just in time. We've got time as this concept. Is he gonna make it? And I think really from a film scoring point of view, it's that that is gonna be the sort of seed of uh, the sort of creative foundation of what we want to go on and build. So now that we have actually identified our theme, what we're going to do is to open logic, and then what we're going to do is to think about starting a project. But actually, just before I go to the file menu, let's just have a think about that too. I could, of course, start with a brand new logic project, and I could start populating that with sound, and again, as I say, beginning to see what sticks and what feels right. But the vast majority of film composers don't work that way. What they'll do instead is to open what's called a template. Now let's suppose for a moment that I was the sort of film composer who worked every single day with strings and woodwinds and brass and percussion samples. I could spend the first two hours of every day of my life setting up exactly the same instruments that I set up yesterday morning, but that of course be a real waste of time. So what templates do is to allow you to configure a group of sounds, effects, all sorts of other things that we'll go on to see, which you can then use as a starting point for a brand new project. And I've made a template for today's session just to give us some sounds to get up and running. So I'm gonna to come to new from template. I'm gonna to come to my templates and here is a template that I've made for this film called Just In Time. Now just before I press choose and we actually open this project, we can see that there are a number of things that we can configure within a template down at the bottom of the screen. For a start, I've identified that at least for the beginning of the film, I feel like a tempo of about 116 BPM is gonna be about right. Something nice and pacey, nevertheless not too too far, so that's gonna just get us started. We'll come back to tempo in due course. I've also identified that I want to work in G minor. I'm working at 48 kilohertz, which is pretty standard for music to picture projects. And also I'm working at a frame rate of 30 frames per second, which is just displayed here as 29.97. So having drawn your attention to those elements, I'm then gonna just press choose and logic will load the project. Now you can see straight away, even though it's taking a little longer than it might be to open a brand new project, not really that much longer and now suddenly I've got a group of sounds which are going to allow us to get up and running and as I say identify our theme of time and how we might just start working but of course I don't have a film yet so let's go to file and let's go to movie and let's go and find it the film was on the desktop we've seen it there already so I'm just going to click there I'm going to bring it in here and then I'm going to press open now when I do that logic's going to ask me whether or not in addition to opening the film I also want to extract the audio track which contains our sound effects and our dialogue I definitely want that I'm going to need that so that I can write to it so when I press OK in comes the film and in comes that audio file on a brand new audio track here at the top okay what I'm actually going to do is to rename this. This is uh, obviously taking the name of the film at the moment, but I want, to be called, I want this to be called Dialogue and Sound Effects. I'm just gonna type this in, and we're going to learn our first key command of the afternoon, which is Shift and Option and N. And what that does is to rename the track based on the track name. So in other words, where I've labeled that, it's now applied that to the region. And actually that's going to be really useful in a number of contexts this afternoon. Okay, so in a moment, what I'm going to do is watch the film with you again. I'm just gonna back the volume down again in here because I obviously don't want that going to be uh, sort of dwarfing what we're going to be doing from a musical point of view. But I'm really aware of the fact that you guys have only seen this film once. And normally what would happen at the very beginning of a project where you'd sit down with an editor or a director is that you'd have a creative conversation about what he or she might want you to bring to the project. It's called a spotting session. It's really common you'll sit down and particularly with longer films, it's a great opportunity to identify themes that might recur later on or talk about instrument groups or maybe someone will have written some temp music and what you'll be looking to do is to sort of find out what works well in the temp and what maybe doesn't work quite so well. So a spotting session is a really good creative sort of kickoff place for the ideas that you might work through with a director. Now we're going to have a spotting session right now partly so that you get a chance to watch the film again but also just so we can identify a, a few really crucial moments including perhaps the most important lesson of the the entire afternoon, which is when to write music and when not to write music. It feels to me at the very beginning of this film that these two guys get together and we don't know yet that they're capable of these remarkable physical achievements. So at the moment they could just be two any guys just hanging out, one guy excitedly saying that he might have got a date with this girl. It's only when they start moving that we become aware of the fact that they might not be like 
the rest of you. Obviously, I'm one of these guys. It's fair to say, obviously. So I've deliberately said you there. So let's just watch it through again. We're going to have a bit of a spotting session, and we'll just begin to identify some crucial moments within the film. So I've muted the dialogue. Let's just watch this through. I'm going to turn the click traffic off as well. So at the moment, we're just in a place where they've come together. This could be any two guys. They're just sitting out, they're just beginning to go to work and just thinking about what they might do next. And then we have our crucial moment. They jump down and they begin to move. And straight away we're into some of their tricks. So that definitely feels like we should have music up and running by this point. At this stage, we're just beginning to understand a little bit what they're capable of. So this definitely feels like an opening theme. And we're running through this section all the way to the point here where they run up the stairs and we get our first slow motion shot. That feels important to me, that moment. Then the pace picks up again. We're in a different background now. We're in the stadium and the guys have separated. They're working ind independently. And now they're back together again at this point, but this definitely feels like we're trying to push things on a bit. Now we're into a third landscape. We're surrounded by trees and leaves and a much more natural environment, and then we're into the maze. This also feels like a sort of third segment of the film overall. And then we get our first glimpse of the girl here. The pace actually continues despite that skid all the way through to that jump, and now everything changes. All of the action has stopped. We have this slightly awkward little interchange. There's a little bit of romance. It's a bit sharp it's a bit tender, it's a bit fragile, and certainly all of the pace has gone out of the film at this stage, and I think we'll need to reflect that in the music as well. So this idea of a spotting session, this idea that we might just go through and begin to understand structurally what the film is doing, feels like a good place for us to start. Now, as I identified at the very beginning, I don't think we need any music. We just want to have those guys meet up and begin to chat. So what we do need to do is to find the moment where the music might start and uh, then make a musical decision about how we're going to make that work for us as uh, the sort of composition department of the project. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and we're just going to watch the beginning one more time and see if we can find a useful place to act as what we call an in point. Here we go. Hello, mate. Guess what? She said yes. You never make it on time. Yeah, not by myself, I won't. Come on, let's go. OK, now this is the moment. The guy jumps down, and this is where I think we're going to start work. And if I use the playhead within Logic, I can actually scroll over this point, make this guy jump up and down, which is quite nice. But in particular, what I want to do is to find the moment where he really hits the ground. And I think that's this bit of waveform here. Let's just watch that again. Yeah, right there. Now, this is the moment where I really want the music to start. And by holding down control at the same time as moving the playhead, I can really identify that moment quite closely. So in terms of identifying this cut, fine. But from a musical point of view, we're in no man's land. I'm halfway between bar seven and eight. This isn't the most helpful place for me to say, yep, that's where I want the music to start. So what I need to do is to move the film so that I can identify this moment as a place where musically I'm in better shape. In other words, I want to move the film to a downbeat so that I can start writing from that point. So what I'm going to do is to copy the time code position, which Logic has identified here in the transport bar. Command and C to copy. And then what I'm going to do is to move over here to the tempo list. And what I can do now is to paste that time code position right here. Now, when I, price, uh, when I do that, the film has now moved, and it's placed that in point at the beginning of bar one. That's not ideal. There's loads of film now, therefore, that's actually before the timeline starts with my project. What I want to do is to shift it late. So I'm actually going to put it at bar eight. And what that should now mean is the moment where the guy jumps down coincides with the beginning of here. You can see that within my template, just so you guys know where we are within the film, I've identified a few key moments here that I've put in with markers. And this one here should be our music start. So I'm going to put the click back in, and we should see, as we run through now, that the click coincides with him jumping down, and that should put us in good shape in terms of actually writing some music. Come on, let's go. OK, we're in good shape now. So suddenly, we've got a useful musical endpoint, which is going to allow us to begin the process of writing music. So let's close down the tempo list. And now we can actually uh, get to the template and find out how I've put some sounds together within here and to find some sounds that I think would be useful. I'm going to just make the film a little bit smaller and put it down in the bottom right-hand corner. And we'll just um, make the display a bit smaller too. OK, so the first sound I've got within here is a sound that I like without question, but I've also included it within the template because I'm sure, like you, if you're a Logic user, I'm not that fond of the sound of the metronome. 
don't know about you, it's kind of annoying. So what I want to do is to be in a position where I can replace that as soon as possible with something musically that is going to be a more inspiring sound. So this first sound is effectively uh, a sort of um, a, a propulsive um, a percussive sound, which I'm just going to use as a starting point for building some ideas based around our theme of time. It sounds like this. Okay, let's record two bars of that. Come on, let's go. Okay, one note film scoring. Great, let's just mute the dialogue and go back to this region. Now, even though I've played this in live, I need to make sure that if I'm going to use this as a sort of loop, something that's going to repeat, it needs to be absolutely in time. So the first thing I'm going to do is to quantize it. So I'm going to select a quarter note there so that the note absolutely starts at the beginning of this region. And then I'm going to press E to open the editor for it. And we're going to learn our second key command of the afternoon and a really useful one, we're to, one we're going to come back to a lot. Let's suppose for a moment that I had only recorded a really short note within this region. I want to make sure that every time it repeats, I get a really smooth loop. The key command I'm going to teach you is shift and backslash. And that produces what's called a force legato. It makes every note last until the next note takes over, or in the case of um, a region where we only have one note in a region, it will last until the very end of that. And that's going to be really useful. It's going to give me a smooth loop every time this region repeats. So that's force legato. We'll come back to it. I've played this note quite strongly. I'm actually going to just take its velocity down a little bit, which I can do within this editor here as well, and we're in good shape. So we've got our first sound, except that I think we could do more with it. In addition to being able to populate a template with sounds, we can also use other things, including effects. And you can see that the first of these is waiting for me right here. It's bypassed at the moment, but this gives me an opportunity to introduce Logic's Step Effects plugin, which is a modular plugin. A modular plugin means lots of separate bits which you can turn on and use the bits of that you want to use. So you can see that around the edges here, I've got power lights for a whole bunch of different types of module. And the two that I'm using are a little bit of distortion, but also this filter. And this one in particular is the one that I want to draw your attention to, because the moment I take this effect out of bypass, you can begin to see that what we've actually done, or what I've done here, is to create a running sequence of steps, 16 steps, and what they're doing is they're being routed through to the filter section of the sound, which means that every single 16th note has its own tone offset. It's either going to be brighter or duller. So when I run that, we should hear it. Uh, you'll hear that the loop suddenly has a lot more purpose. Here's the original. OK, so suddenly it's a little bit more up and running, and we're just beginning to pick up on this theme of time that I've identified. OK, let's have a look at the second sound within our project. I'm going to copy the first loop down to this second sound, and then I'm going to press this one. And it's fair to say, even before I press play, please don't leave. I don't like this noise. Here it comes. OK, sort of mid-80s Depeche mode. OK, now. What I've done here is to identify this sound, not because I want to use it in its current form, but because I want to show you one of Logic's most powerful plugins, which is Alchemy. Now, Alchemy is an absolutely remarkable place where I can combine up to four separate layers of sound. I can then modulate them in all sorts of ways. I can add effects. I can add sequences, all kinds of stuff. And in fact, we can hear the sequences running through this sound. It contains over 2,000 sounds in its preset banks. And you can begin to see how I've selected this one. I've come to arpeggiated sounds, drums, perhaps surprisingly, it's not a very drummy sound. This one is in the soundtrack list, and that threw up these six choices, and I've chosen this one. Now, all of that functionality I just mentioned a moment ago is available within the Advanced tab. And if you are an Advanced Logic user, this is definitely a plugin that you should spend more time with because it's capable of the most remarkable sounds. If, however, all of that feels a bit complicated for now, there was a useful simple tab too. And the reason why I've selected this sound is to show off one of uh, Alchemy's most useful features, which is this area here, which is called the Morph Pad. Now, what happens as I move these target points around, as you can see within the display, is that various parameters associated with this sound are changing. So maybe the reverb balance change and the sound gets a little bit wetter. Or maybe we strip out a couple of the layers of the sound so that the sound becomes thinner overall. And the area of the sound that I'm particularly interested in is this one down here where it says heartbeat. And now, when I press play, we're going to hear a radically different sound, but it is based on the same noise. 
Okay, so why have I chosen this? Well, first of all, it's helping us mark time again, but it also feels usefully like the sort of heartbeat element. Not only does it sort of represent the physical effort the guys are putting in to their run, but it also maybe just allows us to kind of get into the territory of romance later on in the film as well. See what I've done there? Clever, isn't it? Okay, so there we are. We've got our heartbeat now running through. We've got time being marked as well. Now, remember our first key command, shift, option, N, because I copied that pattern down. I'm going to use it again so that the region that we've created there represents or is named after the track that's created it. Okay, one more loop we're going to add from Alchemy 2. Now, of course, I could play this part in. I'm going to just audition it for you on the keyboard. It goes like this. I sort of couldn't resist this sound. In a super contemporary film, the idea that we're going to have lots of anachronistic old clock mechanisms really appealed to me. And of course, I could um, uh, add this as a new file in its own right and just record it. But this is a little tip that I'm going to show you now if you're a film scorer who maybe sits on the train as much as he or she does in their own studio. What we're going to do is just copy this pattern down one more time, again open the editor. And this time what I'm going to do is to select this note, and I'm going to use option and arrow up, and I can step through to trigger the key that that I've just played. Now, if you use shift option up and down, you'll jump in octaves. And as I say, if you just use option up and down, we're moving in semitones. So if you're somebody who doesn't have a full range keyboard in front of them and you're working on your laptop, then actually this is a nice way of being able to move MIDI around. So we've now got three loops, all of which have been triggered from the first one. Again, we're just going to rename that one. And so far, this is all too easy. I've played one note and we've got three loops. I think it's time, from a rhythmic point of view, that we took a slightly more involved uh, look at how we might develop the beats further. And I'm going to do that by creating a brand new region for the next sound. Now, this sound is from um, Drum Machine Designer, which is Logic's kind of flagship electronic drum machine. And what I'm going to do is to press Edit, and what I'll see now is the names of the sounds down the left-hand side, which I want to use within this project are all of the sounds that are available to me. And there are a couple in here that I like. The first one is this sound called Click, which is down here at the bottom. And I want, want a running uh, sequence of notes here, which I'm going to add using Logic's brush tool. Now, I've selected that just from the toolbar here, and Brush Tool is great. It allows me just to draw a line of notes, all of which just seamlessly go into the project very neatly. The only problem is they're all the same color, which means that they're all the same velocity. I don't want that. I want more variation in this sound. So what I'm going to do is to lasso all of these notes together. I'm then going to come to Functions, into MIDI Transform, and then I'm going to specify Random Velocity. Now, what this box allows me to do is, as you would expect from its name, randomize the velocity, the strength of each of these individual notes. And I can set a range for those here. I actually want this sound to be quite low in the mix. And from a velocity point of view, therefore, I'm going to rein these in. I'm going to set a range between 15 and maybe about 40. And then when I press Select and Operate, we'll see that change has taken place. If I come back out now here, they have different colors, and they've been randomized, and uh, they're all a little bit lower in the mix. So that's great. That's what I want. And then what I'm going to do is to add the second sound from this kit that I want to use as well, which is this sound called Noise Impact. Again, I'm just going to make this a little bit shorter, which I can do within this region too. And this sound I've selected because every time we get a jump down or every time we get a strong impact, and there are lots of cut points and hits within this film where that happens, I want to be underpinning that. I'll show you what I mean. If I solo this sound, I'm going to run it from just before my loop. We'll see. This is the moment where the guy jumps down. This sound is going to give us a nice impact, which I think will feel quite good in the context of the uh, rhythm section overall. OK, and you can hear the clicks are sort of marking time in a slightly less old school clock way. OK, so I've got my first uh, bar of drums here. I'm going to repeat that. That's Command and R to repeat. I'm going to select them both into the, tool into the uh, toolbox again. I'm going to glue these two regions together. And actually, I don't want this impact to happen every bar. So having made it a two-bar loop, what I'm actually going to do is to come back to this second impact and just knock that out. And when I come back, I'll see I've now got a two-bar rhythm based on the one that I created for bar one. OK, we're going to do the same thing again with one more drum machine. This one is from Ultrabeat, a different drum machine. I've selected this sound. I really like this kit. It's called Minimalistic. It's full of really small sort of techie noises. And here, I am going to build something a bit more like a sort of conventional rhythm. I'm going to come into here. Again, just double click on the region to open it. I'm going to pick up on the sort of heartbeat pattern that I uh, used from Alchemy. And I'm going to create this little syncopated rhythm, which goes like this. We've already seen that Command and R will repeat, and that will happen with MIDI as well as it will with entire regions. So I'm just going to repeat that first two beats into the second two beats of the bar as well. We've also already seen the brush tool. I'm going to use it again now for the closed hi-hat and just 
put a sort of running series of 16th notes across here, and then I'm going to turn the velocity right down. I don't want these to be uh, too strong. And I'm also going to put in a little bit of a backbeat just on beats two and four, so that we've got something more like a conventional rhythm. That sounds like this. EDM film scoring. Okay, what I'm then gonna do is to repeat that whole rhythm so it becomes two bars long. I'm going to select both of these. I need to change tool, sorry. Let's get rid of those. I'm going to just grab the glue and glue these two together. And now we've got five parts making up the rhythm section of the track. And we'll just hear those all together. Okay, now in our spotting session, I identified that this moment from the moment the guy jumps down all the way through to that first set of runs and jumps that they do, he then runs up the stairs and then we hit the somersault and that feels like the first moment where we want a change. So what I'm actually going to do is to specify all of these loops and I'm gonna have to just them uh, uh, continue through in two bar loops until we get to that section. You can see I've marked it here as a break. So I'm just gonna repeat these phrases all the way through to this point. However, it's going to be a little bit boring if we just have one two bar loop playing the whole way through. I actually want to introduce the sort of kick drum and the backbeat that I've put into this most recent sound um, at bar 12. So it comes in a little bit later. So having glued these two two bar regions together, I'm going to open this up. I'm going to just lasso the notes that I don't want. I'm just gonna move the film for a moment. So I'm gonna close this button here, which is gonna park it up here in the top left-hand corner. So we'll still be able to see it, but it's just occupying less screen space. I'm going to take these notes out and remove them. And I'm going to do the same thing a little bit with this impactful sound as well. At the moment where he jumps down, we get a nice impact. And I think there's another one here. I think there's a, a hand grab where he climbs the wall, but there isn't really a strong moment here. So it doesn't feel like we're going to need this second uh, impact sound here. I'm just gonna take that out. And that will now take us through with a slight development through this opening section. Let's just watch that. Okay, and we're actually hitting that moment where he does his jump really nicely, so that feels like it's working well. I definitely, however, don't want these rhythms to continue through that moment where he does his jump, but I think we are going to use them again from the moment that the pace picks up. So again, for now, I'm just going to grab these two bars, I'm gonna copy them across into this section, and for now, I'm just gonna repeat them a few times just to fill in as a sort of placeholder the next section of the film, because we're going to move on to the next collection of sounds that I've put in the template. Now, as we can see, every time I record something in Logic, remember the first sound that we put in, I recorded in live. And every time you make a recording in Logic, by default, any new software instrument will be green. Okay, this is the slight OCD part of my personality coming through now. I'm a real believer in the idea that it's really useful to you to make the different groups of sounds that you put together color-coded separately. If you come to a project and you've got 100 tracks and they're all green, identifying the sound that you want is really hard. So what I'm going to do is to select all of these, I'm going to hit option C to bring up the color pane, and I'm going to choose this sort of gold color for my drums. And that way, when I start looking at synthesizers, which are the next group of sounds I want to bring in, they'll be a different color to the drums that I'm using so far. Okay, so the next sound within my project is called Growl Big Bass, and it sounds like this. Okay, not that growly, quite big though. I think in order to make this sound justify the name that I've given it, we need to record a bar of it and then begin to see how we can bring it to life a little bit. Let's just put that in now. Okay, so I'm using this sound because I really like this moment. We've got this sort of slow motion cut, he jumps over the fence and we've got a lot of power in the shot and I want to reflect that in the score as well. So again, just like before, I'm going to quantize that. I'm going to open the editor and make sure that the note is exactly as long as I need it to be using force legato. Now, so far we've seen that not only can I put instruments in a template, I can also put um, uh, effects as we've seen and I can also put lanes of automation. Now automation is Logic's way of being uh, allowing you to make changes over time to specific parameters. So what does that mean? Well I'll show you. If I press A we're going to open up the automation tab and what that then does is to give me a lane of automation that I've already added to my template. Now this one is the cutoff frequency for the filter in the synthesizer that I'm using. 
And by drawing a couple of automation points here, we're going to begin to get the sort of growl that I want to bring into this sound. As I draw a rise here, what's going to happen is that the tone of the sound, we'll just solo it so we can hear it clearly, is going to grow. It's going to go from being very muted to just a little bit brighter. Let's hear that. Okay, so that's starting to happen and that feels good. It feels like we could take it further forward though. So what we've done there is to add a lane of automation, but what I want to do now is to start thinking about effects in more depth than we've seen already. Again, I've got a group of effects waiting to go on this sound to help shape it and to help it become the sound I really want it to be. So the first one of those is called Bit Crusher. This is a sort of digital distortion. What I'm going to do is to unmute it so we can hear it. But what I'm also going to do is to draw your attention to this little link button here. I don't know about you, if you're a Logic user, all the time I end up with 15 Logic plugin windows open at the same time, and I'm sort of wading through them and wondering which ones to close. By using the link button, next time I open a plugin, this one will close and the next window will open, which means that I get a much smoother workflow. So now when I press play, we're going to hear this sound. Again, let's just solo it. And this time it's got a bit of digital distortion on it. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. I'm then gonna bring in a more sort of analog form of distortion. Sounds like this. I don't know where you are, but I've got the subs behind me here. This is great. Okay, fantastic. Okay, we're gonna go uh, next. I'm gonna go into channel EQ. Maybe, okay, it looks like the sub days are over because I've rolled out some of the bass from this sound now and pushed the top end a little bit so it's gonna get a bit fizzier. Good, I don't want the bass to become overwhelming, which is why I've done that. And then I'm going to introduce tape delay. Now what this gives me is echo, but the reason I like tape delay so much is because what I can do is to introduce random pitch variation, like old tape machines used to. So what I can now do is to be in a position where I can add what we call flutter, pitch variation to those echoes. Okay, it's definitely starting to feel like a growl big bass, so uh, it's justifying its name. So we've got more inserts, but what I'm also going to do now is to bring in some auxiliaries that I've also prepared for this project. If you're working in a template, and even if you were working with the sort of orchestral lineup that I mentioned at the very beginning, you would want reverbs, delays, spatial effects to be added to your project. It'd be definitely worth making those part of your template. I've done that here. We've got a reverb on bus number one. And what I'm gonna do is just push that a little bit louder. So this is gonna give us a sense of space around this sound. There it is, okay, a little bit more symphonic in character. Now, generally speaking, auxiliaries do tend to be spatial effects, reverbs and delays, as I mentioned. But actually, any effect can be on an auxiliary. And the one that I've prepared for this second effect is a much less conventional auxiliary effect. This one is parallel distortion. This is a distortion channel, which I want to make available to other sounds within my mix as well, which is why I've put it on an auxiliary. But this is definitely gonna give us a lot more power. Okay, so I think we're there. Remember where that sound was five minutes ago, a really low, subby bass sound. So in terms of using effects to shape sounds, that's a really powerful way of being able to build your own noises and feeling like you're sort of in control of the sounds that you're working with. Okay, so let's come out of solo mode because I want to use this sound more than once. I'm going to turn off the loop for a second and we'll just see how this uh, sort of second section of the film is going to shape up. I definitely want to use it again here, and I want to use it one more time as well, but before I do copy it a second time, up has popped a box with Logic asking me if I want to copy the automation data that I've created, which I do, and I also want to copy it another time when I put the third iteration of this region here. So I'm gonna press copy again. Now, we've already got one break here, and I think there's another one coming in the film as well. Yeah, sure enough, I can see from the markers that I've created that I've got another break coming. So if I again just roll over the film, this is the moment where the guy jumps up into the tree and then he's going to jump back down again and I want to pause the music at this point. So I definitely don't need these drums. I'm gonna get rid of those. Remember, we just copied a few regions at the beginning. But what I also want to do is to manage these loops so that they stop at this point. So I'm going to select the scissors tool. I'm going to lasso them all first, then select the, lizard, uh, the scissors tool. And then I'm going to click on this moment right here. Now, when I let go, Logic pops up with this box which says, okay, what do you want to do with the notes at the moment that you're about to cut them? I could keep them, which means that the regions would get shorter, but all of those notes would keep playing. Definitely not what I want. I could split them, which means that the notes would be re-triggered at the point where I'm cutting them, or I can shorten them, which is exactly what I want to do here. When I press OK, we can now see that those MIDI regions stop at that point, which means it's very easy for me to lasso these little bits that I don't need anymore, and they're gone. So we're now hitting that cut too, which is great. 
What I do want, however, is to make sure that this note lasts all the way through. So edit, force legato, and then what I'm going to do is to open up automation again and just make an adjustment here so that that growl lasts all the way through that slightly longer region. So we've got our first synth part running through what I've identified as what I call the action section in this middle bit of the film. Let's have a look at the next sound. This one is from Logic's Retro Synth. This is a really friendly instrument to get to know if you're new to synthesis. So we're going to be using a sound from it here, and we're going to see that the brush tool, which we've used in terms of programming beats, is also a really useful tool if you want to program synths. I'm going to come in here, grab the brush tool, and just create a running sequence of notes here. I don't think they're going to be loud enough. I'm going to push their velocity up a little bit, and what we'll do is just solo this part so we can hear it. I'm going to put a loop around it. Here it comes. Okay, that's fine, but I actually want that to be an octave lower. So I can use the editor here in the top left-hand corner. I'm going to use a transposition offset of 12, so it drops down an octave. What I'm also going to do is to fix the dynamics so they're all exactly the same. Uh, at MIDI 64, um, uh, velocity is measured from 1 to 127, and by selecting fixed in the middle, I'm um, fixing all of these at 64, and then I can create the velocity offset that I want just here. And what I'm also going to do is to use a gate time offset. Gate time literally means note length. So by separating or taking that down to 50%, these notes will be more punchy. And there it is now down at the bottom. Now, if I want to make those a permanent, these changes that I've made here, a permanent part of this region, I can press Control and N, and that's what's called normalizing sequence parameters, which is a posh way of saying that anything I put in that box is made a permanent part of that region. Okay, let's come out of solo mode and just have that part also play through to this moment. We know that that is our out point there, so I'm just going to use the scissors to cut at that point, and then we can throw away that part there, and then it's high time that I actually recorded something again, so I'm going to do that for this next sound, which sounds like this. This is also from Alchemy. Okay, let's just put this part in that I've got in mind here. Okay, so let's sort out timing as well. Again, I'm going to use quantize to put that in time. I'm going to, again, fix my dynamics. I'm going to put a little velocity offset here. This sound, velocity triggers how bright it is, how much it bites, and I want it to bite quite a lot here, so I'm using quite a big velocity offset there. And again, I'm going to fix those parameters so they're made permanent. It's time we picked a color, I think, for our synths. I'm gonna go for something a little bit more purple. I warned you that I was going to be hot on color. There it is again, and it won't be the last time I mention it either, I don't suppose. Okay, so we've got our synths beginning to come together, and we're in good shape. Now, as you can probably tell from my template, I had a sort of joyous process with this film because, unlike usually, my director said, I want you to work with sounds that you want to use with two caveats. There are two instrument groups that I'd like you to consider when it comes to writing the score, and those are brass and strings. And this synth part, this growl big bass part, feels like it might be a good time for us to introduce one of those instrument groups, specifically brass. I think that sound might double really nicely with some raspy brass. Okay, we've still got four sounds which we haven't even identified or looked at yet, but just from looking at their names, you should be able to see that actually none of them are brass. So what I need to do is to be in a position where I can somehow go and find those sounds and bring them in. Now, of course, I could set them up from scratch, but as I said at the beginning, actually that takes time, and somehow you want to work at your, the pace of your creative workflow, and suddenly having to stop and set these sounds up from scratch isn't really ideal. So what I want to be able to do is to browse somewhere else, go and find those sounds if I know they exist in another project, and bring them into this one. And we're gonna do that in just a second. But what I'm also going to do is to draw your attention to anyone working in the template, be careful. So far, we haven't actually saved this this project. Because we started from a template, Logic is effectively using this as an untitled new document. It feels like a good time that we should save it. I'm just going to call it just in time, and then we're good to go. So now we've actually got a new document here, um, uh, which uh, obviously we could recall at any stage. So I'm going to come up to the browsers area, which is up here in the top right hand corner. And within these browsers, I can use all files to go anywhere on my computer to go and find another logic project, one which maybe contains the sounds that I want to use. I've got a little bookmark here. I'm going to go into here and into logic projects. And I've got a project called Brass and Strings, which uses two trombones and two horns, which are the instruments that I want to add to this project. Now, I only want to bring in the 
plugin, which is hosting these samples. So I'm selecting that option. We're going to be using contact for the samples that I'm running this afternoon, and I'm then going to press add, and they're going to be added to my project. Now, you might be thinking, is that quicker than setting those sounds up from scratch? Well, hopefully, we've just answered that question because they're already in the project. They've come in already. So if I close this down, what I can then do is to grab these four parts. I'm just going to bring them down to the bottom of my arrangements, underneath everything else, just as a group so the brass is down here. OK, now we are using Spitfire Audio Symphonic Brass for uh, this collection of sounds. There are loads of third-party orchestral libraries available. Definitely do your research before making purchases if you want to go and buy third-party libraries. I like these ones, which is why we're using them this afternoon. OK, so the trombone sound that I've identified here sounds like this. Big and fruity, and I think you can begin to see that it might be a nice accompaniment to that synth part that I created before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that synth part and just drag it down to here and put it on the trombone track too. Logic is going to ask me if I want to copy the automation data. Of course, this time I don't. There isn't a filter on these sounds in the same way, so I'm not going to copy that. And we should now find that we've got a nice big growly trombone noise at the beginning or at the uh, underpinning this synth part. Good. I think that's going to work well. I'm going to just take the film and put it over there for a moment as well. So we've now got some brass. I think I warned you, they need a brassy color too. Don't say I didn't warn you. OK, Shift, Option, and N. I'm just going to rename those trombones. OK, fine. So we've got the first of our brass sounds in. In a minute, we're going to populate this whole brass sort of setup with some of these other sounds too. But I haven't just bought in brass because I want to underpin some synth parts. I also want to take the brass further and create something a bit more dynamic. Now, again, going back to our spotting section, the next section of the film is what I've identified as what I call the superhero section. Now, the reason I've called it that is if we look through this section of the film again, the guys come back together. They start moving through the trees. They jump down here. We're then suddenly heading towards the maze. And we've got these shots where the guy's running towards us. And this kind of reminded me of sort of watching superhero TV shows when I was a kid. These days, superheroes make billions of dollars, and we've got the whole Marvel universe. But when I was a child, they, superheroes sort of wore their pants outside their tights. And um, these are the sorts of superheroes we're talking about here. I want to find a way of making sure that we get a sort of really big, stompy, old school superhero theme happening underneath this section of the film. So again, what I'm going to do is park the film for a moment. I'm going to take this little two bar region that I've created, and I'm going to repeat it again through this point up to the next moment where the break happens, which I think is here. For now, we won't worry. We'll make that cut in a little while. So I've now got something that I'm going to record to, but what I need to do is to introduce you to the theme that I'm going to write. It goes a bit like this. So we get this big arcing shape. Now, you might already have spotted that we've got a bit of a problem with this sound, but we're going to address that problem in just a moment. Let me put the tune in first. OK, so it stops at that point, and this definitely feels like a good moment to break those drums so that we're also stopping at this moment, at this point. OK, again, I'm going to shorten these and throw away the regions that I don't need. OK, let's just solo this brass part again for a second so that we can address the fact that while some of these notes kind of sound OK, some of them really don't. Again, I'm going to just make sure that from a MIDI point of view, everything is as it should be. I'm going to fix the dynamics. So that again, we're at MIDI 64, and then I'm going to create an offset so that the notes are pushed a little bit louder. And I'm also going to select quantize to make up for my poor timing in any performance issues that I might have had from that perspective. Let's just hear this tune again. OK, so the long notes kind of sound OK. The short ones really don't. Because before they've really had a chance to speak, we've moved on to the next note. And so there's no power. There's no emphasis on those notes. And that really shouldn't come as a surprise. Effectively, I'm sort of asking a sample brass player to somehow know that I want emphasis on the short notes, but I'm happy for him or her, this sample, really, to 
produce a smoother note on the more legato notes. And of course, one patch, one articulation, as we call them, is never going to give me that expression. What I need is a way of being able to switch from one type of articulation to another, so I can move from long, smooth notes to short, punchy ones. And Logic has got a fantastic feature which allows me to do this, which I'm going to introduce you now, which is called articulation mapping. I'm going to close down the region inspector. I'm going to open up the one for this particular track. And down here, I have the option to create what's called a new articulation set. So when I do that, up pops a dialog box. And the first articulation that I'm going to create is called longs, long notes. OK, we are working on MIDI channel one, so I'm going to tell uh, Logic that as well. I'm then going to create another articulation for the short or what we call staccato notes. Again, I want to tell Logic that we're still working on MIDI channel one for those sounds too. And also what I can do here is to add a symbol to these notes. This is the staccato symbol that uh, players would be used to seeing if they were working with scores. And we're going to see that that's going to be useful a bit later on. I'm going to just click the staccato option here and we'll see it again later. <coughs> then what I'm going to do is to come into the output tab because I need to tell Logic exactly what I'm trying to do here. So how do I normally switch articulations? Well, the way that sample libraries work is they present you with a playable range for you to program the notes that you want to work with. But what they tend to then do is to give you also a series of what we call key switches, ways of being able to switch from one articulation to another on keys outside of that playable range. And these samples are no different. What I've got, a key switch is right down at the bottom of my keyboard in octave C minus two, in fact, is the first one, right down off the end, which allow me to switch between these articulations. And in the articulation mapper, I can set those up here. So firstly, I need to tell Logic that we're going to use what's called a MIDI note on message, a key switch, in other words, for both of these articulations. Again, I can just specify the channel that I want to work with. And then what I'm going to do is to say, OK, yep, the long notes are on C minus 2, and the staccatos are on F uh, minus 2, which is here. So what I can then do is to close this box down, and then I'm going to save it. And I'm going to save it as trombones. And this adds it to my articulation list. And now, when I press play on this sound, we should hear those two articulations. OK, that's kind of all right. But actually, I think I might have missed the right articulation for the staccatos that I want. So I'm going to edit that. I'm going to come back into here. I'm going to specify that actually I want to use F sharp 2 for my staccatos. Let's try that instead. OK, that's given me a little bit more power. So that's great. I'm going to just keep that exactly where it is. And what I can then do is to map this across some other sounds as well. So I'm going to make sure that all of these sounds are labeled as trombone. And what I can then do is to copy them down to the second instrument, where I can also specify that I want to use the trombones here. Now, I'm also going to drag them down to the horns, which I bought in as well. But these use a slightly different articulation, which I've made already, which is horns just here. And we're going to put the same thing on this second group of horns too. And now we should have a nice big massed brass section. OK, good. So we've begun to see how articulation switching can work. But that's not the only way in which it's possible to drive samples within Logic. And it's a hugely important feature that we're going to look at next, which allows me to work with what we call MIDI control. Now then, what MIDI controllers do is they allow you to vary different ways of approaching different sample groups. And in particular, we're going to focus on two separate MIDI controllers today. Now, I've got a pair of faders in front of me, which I've mapped. The first one of which is controlling what we call MIDI expression. That is basically just the volume of the samples that we're using. And that's on MIDI controller 11, which is this fader here. The other one controls something a little bit more nuanced. This is the modulation wheel. You'll find a modulation wheel on most controller keyboards. I've mapped it to a slider. But what it's doing here is to allow us to move through different uh, velocity groups. Now, what does that mean? OK, well, let's just first of all explore MIDI expression just to see how easily that can work. So here's one note, and here is MIDI expression controlling its volume. OK. 
So that's pretty straightforward. I can turn it up and down in terms of its volume. But if I use the modulation wheel, we get a slightly different effect. Let me explain this once we've heard it. Okay, so if you're making sample libraries, what you want to be able to do isn't just to have one dynamic layer, one layer of sound which is either recorded loudly or quietly. What you want to be able to do is to fade, cross-fade between those layers so that if you want to produce, let's say, a crescendo, for instance, you're in a position to do that by moving from quiet sample layers through to loud ones, as we just did with that slider. And in particular, what I want to make sure that I can do is to reset the controllers on uh, these samples so that every time Logic comes through to this collection of brass samples, those two sliders are reset. I'll show you what I mean. I'm gonna just record a bar here just for um, MIDI controller information. Here it comes. That was exciting, wasn't it? In many ways, I think that's been the best bit of the masterclass so far. Okay, if we open up the editor, let's just have a quick look at what we've actually done there. Obviously, no note data, but what we're actually looking for here are two lanes of automation data, which I can see within MIDI Draw. As I say, there are no notes, so we're not gonna see any velocities. But if I come down to the bottom, we should see a modulation reset. So this is the velocity crossfading. It drops down and it comes back up to maximum because I want only to trigger the loudest samples. And also, if I look at MIDI expression, that is also being reset. Now, it doesn't matter that I've got all of these individual points. The crucial point is that the last one is at maximum. And that means that every time Logic goes back to the beginning of the project and plays through, it will get to this point, reset those two controllers, and therefore I'll have the volume and the velocity switching that I want across those instruments. So again, I'm just gonna copy this down to the others so that we're resetting those parameters for the brass as well. Again, that's right, it's color time. Let's make the brass all the color we want it to be, and then we've got brass within our project. Okay, so that's working nicely. So we've got our brass theme, we've got our superhero theme that's working within here, but I think it's time we checked back in with the film to find out whether or not our synchronization is as it should be. We saw at the beginning that we had nice impacts that were hitting particular cuts within the film, and what I want to do is to check that we're still doing that at this point. In particular, when we get to this moment here where the superhero theme starts, I want to make sure that that really is arriving at a moment in the film where I want it to be. Again, if I just move the playhead, we're moving through the various frames of the film, and as he jumps down, just like he did at the beginning, I want the music to start. Okay, so we're missing it. Okay, so here is the moment of impact, and by the time we actually get to the point where my theme is starting, he's already sort of down and is thinking about getting back up again. So I actually want to come to this moment here and set this as the moment where the music picks up. So we're going to need a tempo change. I need to be in a position where, by speeding up the music a little bit, we maybe arrive at this moment sooner, which means that we'll hit this moment a little bit quicker. So, where do I want my tempo change to start? Well, I've got a break, so I suppose I could put it right here. But I think, again, we're going to be a little bit more strategic than that and think back, um, uh, taking a slightly more sort of overview of the um, whole film and coming back through here and recognizing that after our opening section and after this nice somersault shot, maybe this next section of the film, this action section of the film, might be a nice time just to take the tempo up a little bit. And as we see the end of this uh, somersault and as we get through to here, it's actually on beat four of this bar that suddenly we get a shot where we get action as he runs towards us again. So this feels like a good time, potentially, or a good place to put in a tempo change. I'm gonna do that by coming back to the tempo list, and this time, rather than doing that from a time code position, I'm actually going to enter one manually. Because I've put the playhead in the position where I want that to happen, Logic knows instantly that this is where I want to add the tempo change. And then what I'm going to do is to push it up one whole beat per minute, because that's how generous I'm feeling. Okay, now why am I only doing that by one BPM? It's not gonna make that much difference, is it? Well, I'm trying to hit a sync point. And if you think about it, I was only missing it by a couple of frames. So a really dramatic tempo change isn't going to get us where we need. Let's see whether or not one BPM does it. If we run back through here, I'm now on my downbeat, and look, yeah, we are much closer to the moment here where he lands. That feels to me like that's going to be better. So we've got a tempo change in the project now, which hopefully is going to allow us to hit that moment a bit more cleanly than we have been.
Good, okay, so when we hear that through and we see that, we've now got the music picking up at that moment. Okay, again, I'm just gonna put the film away for just a second, and I'm going to use Logic Studio strings just to explain a little bit about what I want to do next from a musical point of view. So I've got a tune, which goes up and we've heard it. Now then, what am I going to do to harmonize this tune? So far, I told you we're in G minor, and in fact, we've only been in G. The only chord within our piece so far, the only underpinning from a bass point of view is a series of Gs. At this point, I want something much more melodic and harmonic and something which feels a bit more expansive. So what I want to do as the melody makes its way up is that I want the harmony to drop down so that effectively we're moving in contrary motion and we get something quite filmic and quite big. Let's I'll demonstrate what I mean. Okay, so this is gonna be the overall shape of our tune. Now, I'm just gonna dwell on this for one moment because there's a really important chord here that from a scoring point of view feels like we should be paying it some attention. I'm in G minor. The second chord is F major. The next one is E flat major. Now, within the chord of G minor, the next chord that would make most musical sense would be to use C minor. But that's quite classical and it also feels quite sad. I think if we use C minor, it's guaranteed that this would be the worst date of all time. I'll show you what I mean. That's not gonna go well, is it? Okay, so instead what we're going to do is we're going to change that C chord to a C major and suddenly we get a totally different feel. We're gonna get something which is a bit more optimistic, something we can believe in a bit more. So effectively our two crucial chords are G minor and C major. Okay, now I'm drawing your attention to that because what we're gonna do now is to harmonize this trombone line. And the way that we're gonna do that is by grabbing one bar of our bass line, which runs here. I'm going to open up the editor for it. And we can see that we're starting in G. Good, okay. Then what I'm gonna do is to repeat it a few times through to the end of this phrase. And again, I'm gonna just pinch the end off it here and we're just gonna throw away the bits that we don't need. And I'm then going to glue these together. And what I'm then gonna do is to change these notes so that they reflect that chord progression that I've just taken you through. So by opening up the editor, I can see the chords here. I'm going to make the second bar F by simply lassoing the notes in this second bar and taking them down. I'm then going to take this next bar down to E flat, as I described. Again, I'm just using the same key commands as we identified before. This next bar is going to be C. We're gonna go back up to G there, and then just to really make the point, we're gonna go back to C major again on this chord, and then back to G for the end. So there is one synth part that hopefully now is giving us what we need in terms of harmony support for the melody. Let's just hear it. Okay, it, fine, we can't really hear it because it's being drowned by brass. So let's give it some more support by copying it across to a couple of other sounds that might be able to give us a bit more power. The next one is the next sound that I've got within my template, which is a sub bass. And again, of course I could play this in, but again, this is another little laptop trick that I'm just gonna show you guys in case you're working mostly on laptops. What I want to do is to create a smooth bass line out of this sequence that I've created full of running notes. And the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna lasso all of the notes in every single bar except the first one. And I'm gonna do that simply by holding down shift while I draw this lasso around all of these notes. And very soon we end up when I press delete with just one note at the start of every bar. And if we then use force legato, we've got a nice smooth bass line which has come out of a, a sequenced one. So that was straightforward. Let's also create one more bass line, something nice and strong, which is going to be used on this sound here, which is also from Alchemy. Again, let's just make sure that its name reflects the track. What I want to do this time is to grab the scissors from the toolbar, and I'm going to do what's called a multiple divide. Okay, normally when I click on a region, you can see the scissors are here and waiting, but if I hold down the option button at the same time, they grab this little plus button, which hopefully you can see up on the screen up there, and if I then click on the sort of destination from a time point of view of where I want to make my first chop, which is on the third 16th note or the first eighth or a quaver, if you're a real musician, did I just say that out loud? Okay, what we're gonna do 
is I'm going to chop here, and then when I let go, what happens is, again, logic asks me how I want to split this. And this time, what I want to do is to split it. And what that means is that every single time, logic creates a new region at an eighth note, quaver. Um, what I'm going to do is just be in a position where when I gl glue these back together, and when we open them up, what we should find is that we've now got a running series of eighth notes. Because all of those splits, when I join them back together, of course, are separated by the distance that we specified in our multiple divide. Now, this baseline, I think, is going to be an octave too low, actually. I'm just going to take it up an octave. Let's just hear it. This is quite a strong sort of industrial bass sound. Yeah, sure enough. OK, that's really making the point. Let's hear all of these basses with the brass melody that we've written as well. OK, good. And again, I'm going to make that a permanent part of that region. Now we're getting somewhere. Except that I want to start managing a couple of these moments where we have silence between our sections. Before we get into the superhero section, you'll remember our guy comes towards the tree here. He jumps up into the tree, and then he jumps down. And what I'm going to do here is to introduce a sort of technique that is quite common in trailer music, which is the idea of what we call a sub drop. This will definitely wake up anybody at the back, I think. So if you're snoozing away, just give somebody a little bit of an elbow, because this should do it. OK, so what I've got here is a copy of my sub bass sound, and I've put it on its own instrument. And the reason why I've done that is because on this version of the sound, I've set up an extended pitch bend range. In other words, I've set up a pitch bend range which actually runs across two separate octaves. What I'm going to do is to create a region in this gap right here. This is definitely a really good technique if you're writing music for trailers. So what I'm going to do is to jump into this area, this region, where I've just created this uh, new region. And I'm going to just draw a note at C, uh, sorry, at G4, which is here. I'm going to make sure that it lasts for the entire generation, uh, the, the entire duration of that particular region. And now it lasts a full bar. And I've just extended out the left hand edge, which we'll see the reason for that in just a moment. What I then want to do is again come down to MIDI automation. And this time, I'm going to grab pitch bend. And this time, I can create a ramp by creating one individual point right at the beginning. And then what I'm going to do is to create another point at the end where the pitch bend range drops all the way down to the bottom. Now, you'll see if I zoom in on this that I've let the note establish itself before the pitch bend drop starts and it reaches the bottom just before it ends. And that means that we'll hear the beginning of the pitch of the note before the pitch starts to drop, and it will get to the destination pitch we're heading for just before that bar line. OK, so by itself, here it comes. OK, all right. So let's have a listen to that in context. This should take us through this moment where our guy jumps up into the tree and comes down the other side. OK, so that's a really useful technique. As I say, the reason why I extended out the very beginning is also worth looking at. As we've already seen, the reason why I drew those MIDI changes on our brass parts and created those bars of reset data at the beginning is because I wanted to make sure that every time we go back to the beginning and press play, they are pushed up to maximum before we hear a note. Now, the most recent thing that's happened in my pitch bend drop here is that we get all the way to the end, and it's now two octaves below where I want it to be next time Logic comes back and plays. So the reason why I've extended out this region is because what I'm actually going to do is to create a couple of points here, just literally resetting that to zero before it starts. So extend out the left-hand edge, draw a little bit of reset data there, just so we get a nice smooth moment where that happens. Let's come out of the editor. OK, we're in good shape here now as well. And it's definitely time for us to start thinking about the next group of instruments within our project. Now, you will remember uh, a little while ago, I mentioned that my director likes brass sounds, and he also likes string sounds. And I think it would be a good time now to start thinking about strings for this individual project. OK, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to return to the project where the brass and strings are kept. I'm going to come into here. And this time, in addition to loading the instruments which house the string samples, I'm going to load their content too. And I'm going to press Add. And what that means is that not only are we going to get the sounds 
that I identified that I wanted to use. We're also going to get the string parts that I've put together for this project too. Now, again, don't throw tomatoes at me. Okay, let's just identify why it's the case that I've prepared these in advance. We have a little over 90 minutes together here today, and to say that it took longer than that to write the string parts would be a gross a sort of uh, under-exaggeration of how much time it takes to really finesse samples and sample groups. Now, the caveat here is that everything that's gone into writing these string sounds we have looked at in brass. I've used MIDI modulation to finesse and look at working through velocity sample groups. I've used MIDI expression to control their volume. I've used really carefully uh, 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 velocity to control the actual volume of those notes. And as we'll see, by just opening up one of these parts, there's a lot going on. I'm just going to move all of these string parts down to the bottom so they're out of the way and they're underneath the brass. And if I open up the editor for just the opening eight bars of the first file in, hopefully you'll forgive me. The first thing to say is we've got more articulations. The articulation set for the strings runs to many more. We've got longs, shorts, trills, pizzicato, pluck notes. We've got tremolo and we've got muted consordino notes as well. You can see some of the staccatos here. This is a trill and this is a long note. But it's when we start looking at the MIDI data that's been added to these projects. There's the crescendo that we're going to hear in a moment. This coincides with the somersault shot. But it's in particular the expression data on this part, which is controlling the contour of the volume of this part that you begin to see just how involved this is. In short, what I'm trying to say is that there's no way we would have been able to create these string parts, even if that's all we did within 90 minutes. And I think it's also really worth saying that an afternoon like this and a masterclass like this, I don't want you to go away with the impression that it's possible to do an enormous amount in a short space of time. You should take your time over all of the creative decisions that you make. So we're looking at the strings sort of after the effect. So let's have a listen to them. I will certainly play them to you. That seems only fair. And we'll have a listen to the way that the strings came together and we'll see what they sound like using these samples. Let's have a listen. Forgive me yet? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. I'll soldier on anyway. Okay, now, crucially, we get to this moment of the film, which we haven't seen for some time, which is where everything changes. We've had pace all the way through, and you can hear that the strings are really helping support that. Now, suddenly, as I said, when we went through our spotting session at the beginning, it all changes. We get into a completely different section of the film where suddenly we've got no power, no action, and something a bit more soft and a little bit more fragile. And this definitely feels like a place where we need to bring the tempo down. I'm going to create another tempo change here, just like before. Click plus at this particular moment of the film. And we're gonna come down to 102 beats per minute here. What we've also got is a very different character in this film. And I wanted to make sure that in this particular scene that the character of the string parts that I programmed here changed as well. So what I'm doing here is I'm using consoldino on muted strings, an articulation which is muted. And what muted strings give you is a fragility, a sort of softness, which feels like it would be a good match for this particular scene. But before we watch it, what I'm going to do is to unmute the dialogue so we can actually see this with the film. Now, I'm lucky in a way, the way that this film is put together, I haven't got to worry about dialogue too much. It's a major consideration. Whenever you are writing music to picture, you need to be careful. Words come first. People don't like going to the cinema and not being able to hear what people say to one another. And your job as a composer is to make sure that you stay out of the way of dialogue. Now, that doesn't mean you can't write music under people talking to one another, but it does mean that you don't go and put a huge tune over those moments. Because 
Generally speaking, the editor will just turn around and say, right, well, we can't have any music at this point because it's getting in the way. So I've got the only other part of the film which contains dialogue running at this moment. And the reason why we're going to watch this together is you can see how I began to approach this idea. I wanted harmonically to have our two chords, G minor and C major, return at this point to give us a nice sort of optimistic end for this section. But obviously what I wanted to do was that the little tune that I've written, I want to have only emerge after these guys have spoken to each other. So let's just watch this end section. Hey. Hi. I made it. Yeah, just in time. Imagine if that was a C minor chord at the end. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> okay, Halloween date. Okay, so there we are. We've got our strings there on the end, and you can hear those muted strings there just giving us this softness and this warmth, uh, which I think uh, is, is helping them at this point. Now, let's just park the film again for a second. If you ask any film composer, even those with the most extensive sample libraries known to man, what they would most like or most enjoy about the process of writing music to picture, they will tell you every time that it's working with live music. Musicians. What we can do in samples these days is remarkable. I'm not going to deny that for a second. And sometimes budgets prevent us being able to work with live musicians. But when they're available, it's always better to work with the real thing. And really, if you think about it, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. What samples are trying to do is to get as close to the real thing as possible. Wouldn't it be better to actually have the real thing? Well, we're lucky. We do. What we're going to do now is to welcome out the Guildhall Session Orchestra, who are going to come and play this piece for us. Give them a round of applause, please. That's right, let's have a little more here. There we go. Okay, that's actually enough. Let's not intimidate them. That would be awful. Okay. Now then, while they're taking their seats and just getting plugged in, I need to talk to you about a couple of things because you might be wondering how they've actually got notes in front of them, bearing in mind uh, their music stands are sitting there and they're ready. Well, we're lucky. What we've got within Logic is not only, obviously, an extraordinary set of editors, what we've also got a chance to do is to create really extended scores. And if I just take, for instance, something like this, uh, this um, horn part, for instance, let's just take these regions here and glue them together, what I have a chance to see when I open the editor is that I don't have to just um, look at them within this uh, sort of piano roll display. Let's just roll this down. I can look at these as a score as well. So here is the horn part, for instance. I can see that I'm in the key of G minor, and if I wanted to make changes to scores, then of course I can do that too. Let's suppose, for instance, I wanted to put this tune in the treble clef. I could come to my clefs option here and just simply drag that in here, and instantly the tune that we've just heard, the superhero theme, suddenly gets transferred into become um, our tune at this point. Okay, so what we did was to create a score for every single part, and then what we've done is to zip those across to the iPads that these guys are using as their music stands for today, and they're viewing those in iBooks. So that explains how we ended up being able to look at the scores, and on screen, they look uh, like this. So there's the first violin part sitting on an iPad. OK, that's fine. So that deals with how we actually get the notes in front of the players. Now what we need to think about is how we're actually going to go about the process of recording them. And before I go any further, I'm going to drop the level to the PA system before we get howling feedback. Obviously, at this point, I need a whole bunch of audio tracks because what I need to do is to move and think about the fact that we're recording here to this iMac Pro that's in front of me. Now, we are extremely lucky that what we've been able to do today is to partner with DPA microphones who produce wonderful orchestral tools or microphones for recording orchestras. Now, all of our players have got their own individual microphones. Some of those are clip-ons on the violins and violas. And then we've got mics on stands for some of the other instruments as well. There's also a stereo pair of microphones above James. I'm just going to draw your attention to James. He's not going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. James is a current electronic music student on our film scoring program. So a little round of applause for our conductor, please. It'd be great. <laughs> You don't just get applause, James, you get whooping as well. There was some whooping, I heard some whooping. Okay, so we've got that stereo pair, and we've got another stereo pair on either side of the stage hanging from the ceiling, which uh, you may not be able to see in this light, but you can certainly see at the end of the session as well. So we've got two stereo pairs of mics capturing a sense of the stage, and then we've got a whole bunch of close mics, which are all being sent through to 
three Apogee Symphony interfaces, all of which can contain uh, or give me eight um, analog inputs. So we've got 24 channels of sound all coming through to the computer at the same time. What could possibly go wrong? I'm glad you see the funny side. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to bring those tracks in. And what we're going to see is that they're down here, ready to go. Here is my stereo pair for the front of the stage. Here are the ones on the side. And then we've got our close mics too. And in due course, we will make a recording. But what I want to do is just check that we've got some level coming through. And actually, just before I do completely kill the PA system, I think what I'm going to do is give you a note, guys, to tune up to. Let's just come into our studio strings instrument again. I'm just going to grab something that's a little bit more sustained and give you an A. Okay, so what I want to do is to just check that I've got level coming through to the computer. Now, what I've done is I've put our instrumentalists on groups within Logic. If I click on the first audio track, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a group there called Strings. And what that means is that when I press the record button for this uh, particular track, anything that is on the string group will highlight. You can see suddenly I've got a whole bunch of red recording lights. And if we come into Logic's mixer, we should be able to see those too. If I scroll across to the right-hand side, here is the first group of those, um, uh, those instruments. So, fine, I should be able to monitor those levels as they come in, and that should give us a good sort of starting point. Okay, so what we're going to do next is just give these guys a chance to play it through. So what you're going to hear, guys, is you're going to hear music from bar eight, and uh, you're in at ten. And for now, we're going to just hear the whole ensemble playing together. We're not making a recording just yet, so you can still cough, but don't. Listen to them instead. Okay, here it comes. Everyone ready? Okay, they haven't actually made a recording yet, though, so let's not be too generous just yet. Okay, um, so what we're going to do is go back to the same place. You guys are going to, again going to hear click from bar eight. This time we are going to make a recording, but Brass, if you could stand down for now, we're going to record these guys in two separate blocks. So this is just going to be the strings this time. Again, music from bar eight. Everyone happy? Everyone got level? Everyone happy with uh, where they're at? Okay, fantastic. James, all good? Brilliant. Okay, so this is going to be, again, music from eight, and um, let's make a recording this time. Okay, never be in too much of a hurry to press stop. I want to make sure that the ambience in the room is captured as part of that recording, which is why I've let it run on. I've also stopped it at this point. We need to record the end section, but the um, instrumentalists here need to put on mute. If you haven't already, string players, please do that for me before we go into this final section. So this time, I'm afraid you're going to have a much shorter count in just two beats into bar 37, which is where your first violin pickup will be, please, violinists. And then we get to play our big slushy tune. Is everyone happy? 
Great, okay, let's make a recording, just two beats in this time, so you'll hear music from bar 36. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. OK, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the record lights off for the string players, and we're going to switch to brass instead. So we'll leave those parts in just exactly as they are. I've got another group here. And you can see when I click on this first track here, this one is labeled brass. Now, of course, I'm still going to be using the stereo uh, pair of um, mics at the front and on the sides. So again, what I need to do is just to press the record light, and we've got a smaller group of tracks this time. Now, the brass aren't playing quite as many notes as the strings, so we're in a position to start recording a little bit later. So what we're going to do here, guys, is you will hear music from bar 18, and we're playing at 20, OK? Fantastic. Here we go. This is the brass recording. Uh, you guys can play all the way through to the end of the superhero theme, please. Here we go. Fantastic. OK, so we are in this very odd place where, despite the fact that I've got this amount of talent and these musicians on stage, they've actually done what I need them to. So even though they've only been out here for five minutes, we're going to give them a round of applause and say thank you so much for being part of this. Thanks a lot. <laughs> OK, so as they uh, just unplug a few things, what we're going to do is just look at this sort of stack of audio files that we've created. And you guessed it, the first thing I'm going to do is to make sure that, from a color coding point of view, where we, need, where we need to be, these are our strings. And these are going to be our brass parts, so I just be able to see, at a glance, what is what. The next thing I'm also going to do is just to dive into here, I'm just going to make sure that at the beginnings of all of these individual recordings, remember these are grouped together, what I want to do is just add a little bit of an audio fade to this group so that at the very beginning we have a chance just to fade in just so that where I press record doesn't come in as a sort of really hard piggy start. We're just going to make sure that we've got a sort of half second fade on the front and then maybe something more like a second on the end, a thousand milliseconds. I'm going to do the same thing with the other um, uh, string parts that we've recorded. I'm just going to back these out just a little bit on the left-hand side because remember we had a really uh, hard start into that bar there. So I'm going to just add a little bit of a fade in at that point and then we've got um, another second on the end there on the outro. I'm going to do the same thing with the brass as well just to make sure again we don't get any clicks on the way in or out. Who wants to hear what they sound like? Me, I definitely do. Okay, so <laughs> you all fall asleep. Okay, good. So I'm going to come back to here, and we can see within our mixer area that we've had those groups and they've worked really nicely for us. But what I want to do now is to decouple those groups. This is Shift and G is going to turn them off. And the reason why I want to do that is because I want to hear these microphones individually. These are the string mics on uh, the uh, the front of the stage. So this is the main pair that uh, was above James the Conductor's head. Let's just hear the superhero section for the strings at this point. Oh, yes, PA system. There we are. Nice. OK, what we're then going to do is to put in the other stereo pair, which are on the sides of the stage, and we're going to begin to build a much bigger sort of impression of the orchestra that was in front of us. OK, good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lasso all of the close mics for the violins. Now, what's really interesting is that, generally speaking, until people have done recording sessions for orchestras, you would think that those close mics are going to be the main part of the sound that we're going to want to use today, right? Because that's where all the detail and all the precision is. Well, actually, that's generally not 
how we hear orchestras. Most of the time we either go to concerts or we go to recording sessions. We're sitting where you guys are right now. In other words, at a remove from the orchestra. So you're hearing the interaction of all those players as a group, as a whole series of players, an ensemble group together, and you're hearing the way that the sound interacts with the building that you're listening to those sounds in um, as well. And actually, close mics sometimes sound a little bit unfamiliar to people who haven't heard groups of close mic recordings on strings before. I'll show you what I mean. Here are the strings. A lot of power here, but also quite a lot of abrasiveness too. Okay, so you can hear that they're actually really sort of, I don't want to use the word scratchy, but they're certainly hard and really harsh. And actually, it's really interesting when, whenever you do a recording and you're lucky enough to work with an orchestra, it's worth really walking around the ensemble group as they're rehearsing and just getting a sense of what orchestras sound like when you're close so that you can make decisions about where to put microphones. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to select all of these close mics here. I'm going to come into the mixer. Having selected them, they should all be available to me. And as a group, I'm going to take the close mics down. Most of the sound that I want to use is going to be from the stereo pairs, but these are definitely going to be providing some really useful extra detail for me as well. And then I'm going to do something similar with the brass. Keep these two stereo pairs as they are, lasso the rest right here. And then what we're going to do is to drop down the level a little bit on uh, these close mics and just keep the main stereo group here all together. So what I've suddenly got now by bringing those tracks together and lassoing them in that way is control from a mixer point of view over a number of tracks at the same time. Now, you might be thinking, okay, fine, that means, right, that I can now mute off the samples that were being used at the beginning. Well, actually, no. The samples that I've chosen, the symphonic samples that I've chosen, are actually recordings of a much bigger ensemble set. So the strings in particular, which are from the symphonic series, again from Spitfire Audio, are actually 16 players in the violin sections and a much bigger ensemble group than we've actually had it out on stage today. And what, generally speaking, composers will do if they're working for a really big sound is they'll go for what's called a hybrid approach, a balance between the real thing and the samples which are being used to trigger them as well. I definitely need them to be quieter, but I don't want to get rid of them altogether. So what I'm going to do is to select my four sampled um, brass uh, section, which is here. These four tracks, again, because I've lassoed them, they should all be highlighted together. Sure enough, they are. I'm going to take five or so dB off these so that the samples come down. And we're going to do the same things with the strings as well, just so we've got a balance now between the original uh, strings that we've just recorded and those samples too. Now that should give us an enormous amount of power. Let's have a listen through this sort of superhero section now with all of those parts playing together. <laughs> Okay, so it is a shame that we lost the top note or the brass, but we'll forgive them. Okay, there we are. Not to worry. Now, the next thing we want to do is to get this mix under control. Now, you can see that I've got parts all over the place, and actually, bearing in mind we started from zero, we're doing pretty well that we're now at a track count of 70 already. Okay, with that in mind, what I really want to do is to simplify this arrangement a little bit so that I've got more control over it. What I'm going to do is to grab, first of all, my live brass recordings, and I'm going to put them up here with the sample so that they are together. You can just see that I can move those up to here very easily. But really what I want to do at this point is get my mix more under control. And to do that, what I'm going to do is to use a process called track stacking. I want to create stacks or groups of instruments, or a fader at least, for each of the instrument groups that I'm using. Now before I can do that, I just need to make one little change. This depth charge patch, which is coming from Drum Machine Designer, is effectively in a stack on its own already. Drum Machine Designer is so powerful that it gives me an individual channel for every single sound within a drum machine setup. I'm barely scratching the surface of what it's capable of, but because it's a stack, I can't put a stack in another stack. So what I'm going to do is just extend out this final hit so I don't clip off its length, and then what I'm going to do is to select these regions, I'm going to control click this, and I'm going to do what's called a bounce in place. And when I hit OK, Logic's going to sprint through and turn this MIDI region into an audio file. It's going to put it on its own track. It's going to mute the original. And what that now means is that I can put all of these drums together in one stack. I've selected them all here. I'm then going to hit Create Track Stack. 
and I'm going to use what's called a summing stack. Now, at the very beginning of uh, the session today, I mentioned last year's masterclass, and this is definitely an area where, if you're not used to the way that summing stacks work, I would urge you to look at the video for that. In short, what a summing stack is, well, we can see it actually down here. It's easier to see than it is to explain almost. I've now got a stereo fader, and all of these sounds are being fed into what we call this sum or the summing stack here. So in other words, I'm going to end up with one fader which controls all of the drums. And in fact, I'm going to label it so that I know that that's what that one is. I'm going to do the same thing with the synths, which are here. So we're going to put this into a stack in its own right too. This one is going to be called synths, if I can type. Then we're going to have another one here for the brass. You can begin to see what's happening, which is that my arrangement is becoming more and more under control. With every new stack I add, this one is going to be the brass. And every time I close them down, suddenly everything's looking far more manageable. And once I've done that for the strings as well, what we've suddenly got is our entire mix effectively running on four faders. OK, that looks a whole lot more manageable, and I can now breathe a big sigh of relief. I don't need this particular track because we don't need it anymore, so now we've got our mix just running on four faders. Now, one of the great things about working with track stacking is that what this allows me to do is to start thinking about applying effects, those auxiliaries that we talked about before, maybe to entire groups of sounds altogether. So, for instance, if I suddenly decided that I wanted to put the brass through the reverb that I set up and used on sounds earlier on, I can, and now, because all of those sounds have been folded down to this place, they're all going to pick up that reverb. I'm also going to send them through a little bit of delay, and I'm going to do the same thing with the strings here as well. Now, we know, because we've just heard them a little while ago, that some of the strings, some of the quality in that string sound is just a little bit sort of pokey, a little bit um, harsh. So what I could also do would be to put an EQ on this entire stack and maybe take out a little bit of the harshness, which I think is probably going to be around the sort of two kilohertz mark, maybe a little bit above that, just to take out some scratchiness. I could even put a little bit more air into the sound here using this EQ as well. And what I might also do is just roll out the bottom end, just in case we've got any sort of noise from the stage. Again, because we set up our recording session in order to do this so quickly, there might just be a little bit of scuffle, a little bit of noise. I'm going to prepare for that by just putting a little, what we call high pass filter, roll off the bottom end, just for super low frequencies down here. So because I've put that EQ, that tone change, on that channel, it will affect all of the sounds that are on the mix at this point. Now then, there are a few things that we need to do. I've only got my synths coming in in the second part of the uh, track, and I want them to happen a little bit earlier. I'm going to bring them in with the drums so that they happen from the very beginning. So the first thing I'm going to do is to take this first sound, our little analog uh, retro synth patch, and I'm going to have this run through here just to establish that we're running in G minor. I'm also going to grab this, um, this ARP part from Alchemy. I'm going to chop that. I only need two bars of it. I've played G, D, and G, so that's sort of spelling out most of the chord of G minor. I'm going to shorten it for now, because I don't need the notes that I went on to play later. And what I'm going to do is to extend this region out to this point. And again, I'm going to use force legato. Let's come back to the piano roll display. Force legato on all of those sounds. And again, they will fill up the whole of that region. So suddenly, we're just sort of populating the front with a couple of synth sounds. You'll remember I did a, a huge sort of velocity boost on this sound after we recorded it. Here I want it to be a little bit more set back. So I'm actually going to take the velocities down at the very beginning here, about 30 units, so that suddenly that's just a little bit less strong at the beginning. Let's just have a listen and see how that sounds. Good, so we haven't just got drums now running at the top, we've got some other sounds too. So we've seen that in a template, we can obviously bring in our software instruments. We also had a whole bunch of audio tracks waiting for whenever we want to make a recording. We've seen that we can assign inserts and auxiliaries as well. But what we can also do is to prepare sounds maybe from Logic's loop browser, a series of audio files, so that we can pick out a couple of those to add to a project as well. And we're going to do that next. If I come back into the media browser area up here at the top, we're back into the all files area. I want to come into files specifically for this particular project. Now, I've now got loads of audio files because we've just made a whole bunch of recordings. If I control click on this arrow, they'll all fold down so that I've got a much more manageable group of sounds to work to. And the two sounds I'm interested in are this one. This is a sort of suspended symbol, an orchestral symbol, which we'll come to in a moment. And then I've got another little loop here, which I've got something specific in mind for, which we're going to use in a while. I'm going to turn the volume of that one down because it's an absolute ear melter. 
and I'm going to mute it as well. Okay, we're gonna come back to this symbol and focus on this sound first. Now, by looking at this waveform, you would be forgiven for thinking that the part of it that I'm interested in is this area here, but actually, sometimes small is beautiful. We're going to use this little bit here at the end, this tiny little bit of sound. Now, I'm actually, because I want it to be a bit louder than it is right now, going to do what's called a region gain on it so that the whole thing comes up about 5 dB and I can control the gain within the inspector here on audio files. And we're going to make it a little bit shorter as well, just so um, we're uh, working around the area that we're wanting to use. Now, you can see, even from the waveform display of this sound, that it sort of builds and peaks to a particular point. And again, this is a useful little exercise. What I'm going to do is just grab my scissors tool and I'm going to chop this region at exactly the point where it builds to the top of this waveform, which is right here. And I'm going to then throw away this section. So effectively what we've got now is a cymbal crash, which sounds like this. Okay. Now, I've just dragged this in from the media browser. It's not actually in the location I want it to be. The place where I want it to go is right here. I'm going to move the playhead to this point where the superheroes theme starts. This is a great key command. I'm gonna press colon. And what happens is that the, any region that's highlighted snaps to the playhead so that right there, it's in the position where I want it to go. What I can then do is to use exactly the same technique. I'm just gonna copy this again anywhere. I'm not thinking about where I'm putting that. Then I'm gonna put the playhead exactly where I want this to go. And again, colon to move it. So very quickly, and this is a really good technique, not just for composers, but if you're a sound designer and you're working to picture and you want to play sound effects at specific locations, use that key command. Having done that, I'm then going to uh, sort of move out the left-hand edge of that so I get my cymbal roll coming back in, adjust the left-hand edge as well, and I think, again, we might just put some fades on these, half a second in, maybe a second out, just so we're contouring the shape of that sound as it plays through. And then what I'm also going to do is just add some reverb to it so that it's sort of in the space of the rest of these sounds. Okay, so here is our cymbal roll, which is just going to be used as a sort of transition sound between various sections of the film. Okay, good, but we've got a yawning gap in the film at this point. We've got a nice string crescendo building up through the somersault, but as I said earlier on, we've then got a lot of action, a lot of power, which is then happening in the shot from the moment that the pace starts moving. Here is our super slow-mo shot, and then suddenly, as we already know, because we've got a tempo change there, what we've then got is the action and the pace picking up again. And in order to do that, I'm going to do something a little bit silly. I'm gonna be honest, and I'm going to use this loop. Don't say you weren't warned. Sorry, okay, there we are. Now, I don't like all of this loop. I do like, though, the power and pace that comes at the very end in the last two beats. So what I'm gonna do first of all is I'm gonna move it to this point here, and then what I'm gonna do, just so it's in line with these two bars, and then I'm going to snip the last two beats so that we're just focused on a much smaller area. I think the last two beats, where are we? We are here, okay. So I'm then gonna throw away this part of the loop. I'm going to copy these last two beats back and back again. Now, we don't want two beats here. That would be halfway through this bar. We know that the pace picks up on beat four, so I'm going to just make that a bit smaller. Okay, I don't think this is gonna sound very good. It's gonna sound very looped. Let's just hear that. Okay, I've also put it in the wrong place, so let's just move it back a bar. There we are, let's try that again. Okay, so that's taking us nicely through to this moment where he jumps over the fence. However, I don't like the fact that it sounds as looped as it does. What I want to do is to put a sort of dedicated audio effect on this sound, and the one that I'm going to use is Logic's Auto Filter. This is going to, again, give me tone control. I'm going to take the envelope down. I don't want any envelope shaping on this sound. I do want to use what's called a bandpass filter. This is a narrow band of frequencies right in the middle of the sound. We're going to lose bass at the bottom and treble at the top, and we're going to focus on this area in the middle. And I'm also going to just turn resonance up so it bites a little bit harder, and then I think we'll be in good shape. So, what I want to do is to automate that filter. I'm going to come into automation again. I don't have a lane ready for this sound, so I'm going to come into the auto filter and go and find the parameter that I want to use, which is here, and here I can then create a sort of starting point for the shape of this filter move that I want to make. I'm gonna have it rise up to this point here and then drop down through the following bar, and we should just be able to hear that. Again, I'm going to smear that with a little bit of reverb and again, a little bit of delay. 
And you will also remember, right at the very beginning, I talked about this unusual auxiliary that I'd created, which was a parallel distortion treatment. I'm going to add that to this sound too, sort of justifying uh, the, the setting up of that treatment on an auxiliary. Again, let's just hear that sound by itself now. OK, good. So now we've got a bit of tone change, and it sounds much less looped. And we've got this nice little transition running through this section. Let's just watch that with the film. Great. OK, so these are both sort of percussion elements as well. So I want to make sure that I'm adding them into my drum stack so that they become controlled by those drum regions. I'm going to just, again, make sure that they're the right color. And then I'm going to make sure that I just simply drag them up and place them within this drum stack. And then they can become part of that group overall. OK, there is one more sound that I want to put into here in this project. Coming back to the superhero section, let's just come here for a second. What I really want to do, in addition to all of the power that's coming from the brass and the strings, is I want to add some drums. All of the drums and percussive elements we've had within the piece so far have been these kind of slightly more electronic, techy sounds. And now what I really want is a big drum kit to come through and drive this section forward a bit more. And we're going to do that by using Logic's drummer instrument. I'm going to press plus and select drummer. And then I have a chance to choose what type of genre of drums I'm going to use. And rock is going to get us started, I think. I'm going to press create. Create, and when I do, we get to see the interface for this particular instrument, which is a bit unusual. First of all, I get this overview waveform display here, sort of demonstrating or showing where the hits within this drum part are going to fall. We'll come back to that in just a moment. What I also get at the bottom of the screen is this interface, which allows me to set whether or not I want to use a simple or a complicated rhythm and whether or not I want to use soft playing or loud, heavy playing. Well, I want a sort of simple rhythm, which nevertheless is nice and strong. And what I'm then going to do is to move this region to the point where I want the drums to start, which is here, where the superhero section starts. Now, what I want to do is to make this a bit smaller. I'm going to work in two bar loops. And the reason for that is I want to keep the core pattern the same, but every time the next two bar region takes over, I'm pushing the fills up. Now, what these are doing is making the ends of the regions different by producing a drum fill each time. And we'll see every time I push it on, the waveform display at the end changes, but before it doesn't, because the core pattern is the same. And then basically, right at the end, we've got a 3-4 bar, which we're going to take through to this break. And I want that to be almost all fill. OK, what I'm then going to do is just slightly drop the volume, because I think this might be a bit overwhelming otherwise. And let's just hear how the drums sound now with the strings and the brass in the main section of the film at this point. <laughs> OK, instant drums. That's fantastic. OK, that's working really nicely. So we're in good shape as far as that's concerned. And again, what I'm going to do is just to make sure that that new part is part of my drum stack so that uh, it's being controlled by the same fader. And again, what we can do is just make sure that our drums retain their color. OK, good. So we've got our drums sorted there as well. And now we're in good shape. Now, the power of having our mix on four faders should become really apparent when we start making final mix changes to this project. What we're going to do now is watch it all the way through. I'm going to put the film down here so you can see it against the picture. But what I'm going to do is just to open up the automation lanes for these stacks so that I can make volume offsets to these instruments. It could be that the synths are too loud at the beginning or they're not loud enough. And I want to boost their level overall. It could be that I want to make space for the brass melody or make other changes too. So I've just selected volume as a parameter for all of these separate stacks. And as we listen through, I might make a few changes just based on what I can hear as we listen through. Here it comes.
OK, so effectively in real time, as we watch down through 90 seconds, we can make these changes really quickly. I have indeed made more room for the brass melody by taking the strings down at that point. But there is one thing that I was tempted to do but didn't do while we watched through, which I want to just take you through very quickly, which is we've got loads of sort of decay and echo happening in the drums at exactly the moment that they come to an end just before we get into the final section. If I run this through in a second, we'll hear loads of those sort of little clockwork mechanisms just carrying on. I don't really want that to happen. What I'm going to do is to draw a volume change here so that the drum bus just drops in volume before we get into that section. We should hear them fade away more naturally now. Good, okay, so we're out of the way before we get into this fragile ending at this end point here. Good, okay, so what we've now got is our tr mix organized by instrument group, and what I'm now in a position to do is to start thinking about a sort of final mix. But final mixing in film scoring isn't the same as working in final mixing when you're working with pop records or if you're making dance music. So instead of a sort of stereo file, one that I can either put online or distribute in some sort of way, what I really need to do when I'm thinking about film scoring is thinking about working with these stems that I've created at the track stack stage. I'm really lucky in that I'm working with what we call locked picture. This film is finished and it's not going to change. But most of the time, if you're hired as a composer, you are part of the creative process and you're not just hired at the end of it. And it could well be that the whole way through the writing process, you're getting sent new picture, where currently, or um, with each new update, you need to think about cutting particular moments out or extending others as scenes develop and change, so your music will need to as well. And what that will often mean is that an editor will ask you for the stems of your piece rather than one stereo mix which covers the entire duration of the piece. And what we're going to do is precisely that. We're going to give the editor or the director of this particular project a set of stems that he can work with so that he has independent level control and other control over these different groups. So firstly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the reference file that came in with the film and I'm going to put loop markers around those because, remember, they represent the start and the end of the film. And I want to make sure that when I record these stems and make them uh, available to him, they are absolutely synced to the very beginning of his picture. He can drop them at frame one at the beginning of his project and they will line up and he then has control over them. What I'm then going to do is to come into the mixer and we're going to begin to see how we can configure logic to actually record these stems internally to create the tracks that we want. I'm just going to put the picture out of the way so that I can see exactly what I'm doing and you can too. So every time we create a new track stack, Logic creates a stereo output for it so that we can hear it. But what I'm going to do is to overwrite these by selecting a bus channel for each of these instrument groups. Here is an auxiliary that I've created, which I've called Drums Return. Now what that basically means is that the sound of the drum stack is now going to get sent to this bus where I'm going to be able to record it. And if I then specify the following three tracks as well, and I hold down Option while selecting the bus output, I can then assign these three to their channels as well. This one's going to go to bus 29, the synths, the brass are going to 30, and the strings are going to 31. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to lasso all of the individual effects tracks too. That's the parallel distortion, and the reverb and the delay, and these reverbs and delays over here as well. And manually, what I'm going to do is to route those through to another bus, which I'm going to call effects return, which is here. So those sounds are now being sent through to their own dedicated outputs. What I'm then going to do is to close the window down here and create five new tracks within Logic. These are going to be audio tracks because these are going to record each of those buses internally back onto new tracks. And what I'm going to do is to specify that I want the first one of those to be on bus number 28. And then if I hit ascending here, it means the next track that I add will be on 29 and the one after that on 30. So it stands to reason that if I make five of those, what's going to happen is that these five new audio tracks are going to be set up with bus 28 as the input, then 29, then 30, then 31, and then 32, which means that effectively this is what we might call my drums return channel. In other words, it's going to receive the input coming from this track stack and it's going to record it. The next one is going to be the synths return. The one after that is going to be for the brass. The one after that is going to be for the strings. And then I'm going to give my director the option of having a dedicated 
FX channel two. That's gonna take all the reverbs, all the delays, the parallel distortion, and a reverb that came in with the drummer region that we added right at the end, and it's gonna print those onto a separate file. The reason I'm doing that is that he might suddenly decide that he wants more reverb, and by having a separate stem for it, he'll be able to boost the level of that track. If he decides he doesn't like the reverb, he can pull it down, he's got even more flexibility. What I'm going to do is to mute these channels. We don't need to hear them as they go down, but obviously what I do want to do is to make sure that I'm recording all five of them. Now, we've already specified that we want the recording to start here. We put a cycle range around this. So what that basically means is now that when I press record, we're going to see, hopefully, all of these individual groups get recorded to their own audio tracks, producing stems for us in the process. Here we go. Now, remember, that isn't going to start right away because the music doesn't start until bar 10. Okay, so what we should now have, if I take these record lights out and we unmute these tracks, is we should have each of those individual sounds having printed to its own stem. So in other words, if I solo the drums, this should just be drums. Good, this should just be brass. Good, and this should just be strings at this point too. Sorry, synths. And then down here, we've got our effects return. This is gonna sound a little bit odd. This is just the ambience from those effects groups. Now, just to make this point, this hasn't actually required me to go through my Apogee interfaces in the same way that it did when we made our string recordings. You can do this on a laptop. Take your outputs from your stems, route them internally, and record them back onto audio tracks, and you'll get the stems that you need. What I can then do, of course, is to come back, put my loop back on, and what I'm going to do is to specify that I want to export these tracks so that I'm ready to give them to my director. File, export, and then I can take these five tracks as audio files, and up pops a dialog box that says, okay, fine, where do you want to put these? I'm going to put them on the desktop so I know exactly where they are. I'm going to create a folder here called Just In Time Exports. And then I can choose a few options. I'm going to export what's called the cycle range, so from the beginning to the end, so that we're only exporting the area where he's going to be expecting to hear sound. I can choose the format of the files. He's going to want WAV files at 24-bit. And you can see that the file names are taken from the track names that I've created. So this one's going to be called drums, and there's going to be one for synths and brass and so on and so forth as well. And when I press export, I don't think this is going to take very long. Logic is going to fly through those files, and they're done. They're sitting on a desktop ready for me to give to my director as a series of individual stems. And there we are. Okay, so we've gone from a completely empty document to a film score where we've actually recorded stems all the way through. We've covered an absolutely enormous amount of content in a short period of time. And I think it might be a good idea if we just summarize before we wrap up. I promise I'll keep this brief. So before we even started scoring, we thought about film themes. If you're looking for inspiration in terms of actually getting started, make sure you identify a theme in the film that you're working to, at least one, and make that your kickoff point for your creativity. Then choose whether or not you want to start with a brand new project, and we've seen the power of templates, working with a group of sounds that are gonna get you up and running a bit more quickly. 
And then think about tempo and time signature. I had a tempo up and running, but we've adapted that twice. One push to make things a little faster, and then we've pulled back towards the end. We haven't really had a time today at all to talk about time signatures, another really useful musical um, device for managing uh, sections between different areas, particularly in our breaks. I've got a few little time signature changes. Look out for those and use them whenever you can too to manage um, transitions between scenes. And we've also seen how powerful it is to select a time code point and place that at a musically relevant point within your film. I identified my in and I moved that to bar eight so that musically I was in good shape. We then have spent so much of today working with the power of MIDI. Velocity, of course. We looked at force legato, one of the most useful key commands of the afternoon without question. But we also then went on to articulation mapping and using that so that we can move between articulations between samples uh, in, uh, in uh, different libraries. And then what we did as well was to bring sounds in from another project. We browsed across to another project and brought those sounds in. We used the brass and then the strings as well. And we've seen how MIDI controllers work using MIDI modulation to move between velocity groups and MIDI expression to control volume overall. Then, of course, the ace in the hole of the whole afternoon was that we had a chance to do a live recording, which was thrilling for me. Um, just so nice to work with players of this caliber. We have spent some time looking briefly at logic scoring um, tools, and we've uh, begun to see, see how we could get those across to the iPads for them to use. And then what we did was to work with groups within Logic to make the whole recording process really straightforward. By pressing one record light, they all came on for all of those groups together, and all of those sounds could be recorded at once. And then what we did, using track stacks, was to put the whole mix on four faders, so that immediately each instrument group has got its own control from which I can send it to auxiliaries and add additional effects. And then right at the end, what we've done is we've recorded those stems onto their own individual groups so that they're ready to be given to the director. And I've exported those and they're sitting on the desktop waiting for him. Okay, the last thing I need to do is to thank all of you for giving up your afternoon one more time. There you go, a little bit of brightness again. Get that into the eyes. If you've enjoyed this and if you wanna get involved in the conversation, then there are a couple of hashtags that you can use on social media if you like. But the most important thing to say is what I always say at the end of masterclasses, which is, Back your own musical judgment. Go and find sounds that you like. Import films that you want to work on. Even if this is not the sort of soundtrack that you would have written, take away from this the techniques that you might want to use. Think about, for example, articulation switching. Think about what we've done with MIDI controllers. All of these uh, techniques are going to be relevant to you regardless of the musical genres you favor. So thanks so much for coming. See you next time. Thanks.